Yes, hello. I'm going to speak today about the evidence ecosystem. I'm going to focus on some challenges for guideline developers. But not to depress you all, I'm also going to talk about some, how some groups have overcome these challenges with uh, some new innovative solutions. Uh, my name is Lynn Brandt. I'm an internist, so I'm a heavy user of guidelines. Uh, I'm also part of the Gin Tech Working Group. I have uh, no financial uh, conflicts of interest, but I am a member of the same magic um, organization that Gordon uh, declared. Some of the examples that I will talk about come from projects that magic is involved with. So let's start with the current ecosystem. It has developed through hundreds of years of producing evidence and disseminating. It, it has some challenges, uh, some things that are good and some things that are not so good that could be improved. Of the good things that we've heard today is the development of new methods to increase the quality of the evidence that is produced in the different areas in the ecosystem. Of the not so good things, the implementation of these methods are not often complete. Also, the format on which the evidence is uh, disseminated is not optimal for sharing across the ecosystem. And unfortunately, we still work in silos. So what do I mean with this? Let's start with the production of evidence. Studies are usually produced now as big blobs of text. They are hard to find and hard to understand unless you read them. So systems, technological solutions cannot help us that much in finding the studies. Somebody still have to read the studies to, to find out what they're about. And when you find something of relevance, data cannot be extracted uh, automatically. Somebody has to sit there and copy-paste uh, the information over in systems used for synthesizing evidence. And then we move to the synthesizers. Lo and behold, they also uh, publish their um, content in big text blobs, which the guideline developers then have to read and find. Um, and when finding something of possible relevance, data cannot be extracted from them either. Uh, and we all probably experience that synthesized evidence do, do not always uh, answer all our questions, which means that guideline developers, us, need to do a lot of work ourselves, which takes time and costs a lot of money. Uh, and then we come to us, the guideline developers, we also publish our content in big blobs of text. Something, some in, on the internet, but it's still blobs of text. Some is still in paper. We do not allow data to stream down into downstream uh, resources like patient tools or decision support. And that means that people using our content need to copy paste them into their own systems and that loses uh, the connection to the original, so when we update our guidelines, downstream res resources becomes outdated. When one group then uh, creates a guideline, you can be sure that there are at least a couple of other groups uh, working on exactly the same, due to the, the fact that we still work in silos. And the ones that are implementing our guidelines, to put them into systems like decision support system need to cut their guidelines into smaller manageable pieces, which also then um, make, makes it uh, hard for these small pieces to get updated. The data is not coming through. For the ones that implement and improve practice, groups uh, spend so much money and time on the previous steps so that uh, evaluation and improvement of practice uh, doesn't always happen. Um, and uh, when it does happen, uh, it often happens as eternal reports uh, and not, it's not published out into the body of evidence so that other groups can learn from it. So these are the challenges. So let's move away from all this mess and into a new um, probably more efficient um, evidence ecosystem. So a lot of groups are working towards a more trustworthy, efficient, and integrated ecosystem. Um, and I'll just show you some examples of how these groups have worked. Let's start with the production of evidence. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Um, to co complete this, uh, there's uh, some factors that are needed. Um, you want common methods and standards to help us. We want a culture for sharing. Uh, we need tools and platforms to help us. Uh, we need digital structured data to flow through the ecosystem. Uh, we need trustworthy evidence um, so that we can use each other's content. So now we'll start at the same point uh, as in the previous picture. So in the production of evidence, it would be very good if the ones creating studies got data about implementation of guidelines and how it's used in practice so they can uh, perform studies on relevant topics. Also, when uh, evidence is produced, it should be with available data and searchable information. And some publishing houses have started to push their um, people uh, publishing studies into also uh, deliver the data, which is good. Uh, this data then should flow over to the, the ones synthesizing evidence so they can put them directly into their systems. Let's take a closer look at the connection between synthesized evidence and the guidelines. So synthesized evidence is essentially small packets of data. And of these packets, some is relevant for the guideline developers to get with other information to create uh, recommendations. Uh, this data should be able to extract, be extracted automatically into systems for guideline development, and some systems like that uh, exist. Um, Cochrane, for instance, uh, publish all their data, and that could be extracted into guideline systems. Um, but there are few systems like this today, and of course, system-to-system -system integration is possible, but what we want is that all systems can integrate with each other, so we need standards. One group that has been working on a standard for data exchange is the EBM on Fire project. Also, we know that guideline developers, they do constantly find new questions they, they would like to work on. Then wouldn't it be nice if information about what uh, questions they want to have answered would flow back into the synthesizers, creating their own little um, ecosystem so that uh, synthesizers could produce uh, data that is uh, of relevance to guideline developers. So they can update the systematic reviews and that can flow directly into guideline development. One group that is working on this is the Living Systematic Review, Living Guideline uh, project headed by Cochrane. Let's look at uh, other uh, groups downstream from guidelines. Dissemination of evidence to patients, like Gordon talked about, tools for shared decision making. Today these are costly and time consuming to make, and they're not always up to date. Wouldn't it be nice if data could flow from guidelines directly into these tools? One project that has been doing this is the Share It project uh, that Magic is involved with. Um, and uh, that project has made tools to take data directly from guidelines and produce these patient decision aids. That has the benefit of always being update uh, because it takes data directly from guidelines. And now look at some of the important components, like the culture for sharing. I'll give you one good example of sharing. In 2017, uh, the National Pain Center in Canada created opioid guidelines in fully digitized form, with all the evidence digitized down into which study that was used from each estimate. That in itself is great, but they also share this information with the Danish government that could now extract all that information into their own guidelines and, and concentrate on what is important for the Danish population instead of using all their time to search for evidence. That meant that they could publish these guidelines faster and I think it took about two months from they got all the evidence until they could uh, put the guideline into public hearing. That makes for happy Danish people. There's other components that are very important. 
like a common methods and standards, and also to able to produce trustworthy evidence. Gordon presented this project of rapid recommendation that it was a project together with BMJ. There, in that project, uh, several recommendations across several clinical areas have been made with the help of many different persons from many different organizations all across the world to create these uh, recommendations. And one critical factor here was that all of them agreed on the same methods and processes to create guidelines. And that is key. Uh, and if single people from different organizations can uh, agree on what methods to use and what processes to use, maybe then also whole organizations can agree on that and start to collaborate. And I also want to show um, an example from implementation of evidence using one of these digitized guidelines. So if, if data was available from guidelines, like in this project, um, where there was um, a guideline that was fully digitized and it was uh, published in 2016, uh, the guideline, uh, the decision support uh, company EBM Meds from Finland took these uh, recommendations and created decision support out of it. And because they used a direct link back to the original guidelines, they could take the, the information, the text and the data and put it into their own system and have a direct link to the original guidelines. So now this decision support artifact is always up to date. Data should also flow into evaluation and improvement of practice, but I think I used all my time, so I'll let that up for 2019. So I just want to, I hope some of these uh, things would inspire you to uh, share and get systems for um, uh, transferring data across. And I wish you happy guideline making and a happy and good conference further on. Yes, thank you so much, Lynn, for this introduction to what you call the evidence ecosystem, the new evidence ecosystem. Uh, just this morning, I um, took part in a meeting of a new GIN working group, the collaboration working group, and they were discussing issues around how to collaborate within, within one sorry, guideline panel. So these are the issues that are many people are, are occupied with at the moment. So I wonder if really everyone's ready to, to um, follow the way that you just showed with the idea of the ecosystem, which is collaboration in a much broader way. And you see, that's a topic that really interested people. We have a lot of questions, and I'd start with the most popular one. And I think there are two who are a bit alike, so you, maybe you can answer them together. What is the biggest barrier to establishing a global ecosystem, developing a culture of sharing, agreeing, common standards, or something else? And another one was, um, don't you think the ecosystem is a bit too rational? As we all know, policy processes um, is much more complex than this heuristic approach. Could you please elaborate a bit more on its limitations? So it's a bit about barriers and limitations of this idea of the ecosystem. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> challenges out there, like I outlined. Uh, we, we need to kind of get to a point where we're willing to share, but also that we have trustworthy evidence that we can share so groups don't have to duplicate because they don't trust other people's content. Uh, and, and one key is uh, to agree on standards and also be transparent of what standards and, and methods you have used to develop uh, your content. Making the content available, I would say, is, is very important. Right now, we have to read each other's 800 pages of guidelines uh, and copy-paste information out and then kind of lose the uh, connection to the original. Uh, and, and then uh, both groups have to update their own content. So I, I'm not sure if I can say one thing that is the most important. All of these things are important together. Thank you. So another question. Um, how does HTA fit in the ecosystem? I thought that was a bit answered by the presentation, but actually many people felt that it was an important mm. issue. I did mention HTA especially, but they definitely fit into the 
uh, the ecosystem with producing uh, good quality evidence that guideline panels can use. It's the exact same mechanism than for systematic reviews, for instance. The HDA organizations need to agree on standards or be transparent to what standards and methods are used and make their data available for further use downstream. Okay, I think one more question. Um, how do we promote all of this collaboration in an environment of intellectual property, pet patents, and, sorry, I read patients, um, and personal financial conflicts of interest? So start with the, the, the latter one. So yeah. personal and conflicts of interest should be transparent. And in, in the new good methods out there for producing contents, <laughs> One of the things that you should do is to declare uh, conflicts of interest. When it comes to uh, collaboration in environment of intellectual property, yes, some people uh, are producing guidelines, for instance, uh, that has a, a fee to them. That's perfectly fine as long as they also give out the data. Uh, giving out data doesn't mean that you have to do everything for free. Um, but making the data available makes the ecosystem more efficient. And one very last question who tries to focus a bit on the practical point, who is going to provide an infrastructure for this? Who is going to do it so that everyone can share it? Who better than Jin? <laughs> uh, uh, but to be more practical, there are... Um, um, groups out there that are making tools uh, that makes all of this easier. Um, there's no tool endorsed by, by GIN, but there, there so certainly are a lot of GIN members that are making tools. And to promote uh, the GIN tech working group a little bit, we have collected these tools and put them in a list uh, for you all to, to look at and see what can fit your organization best. Thank you. Still a lot of questions. Please contact Lynn after the plenary. And I really appreciate that you're very busy and active in participating in the session. Thank you, Lynn.